chapter 32. We're correcting four errors. We're not doing that to lie you is, as he is talking. And he has been sitting simmering on the ball as these four lies have been pr proposed and been built upon in all the discussion of Job and the three friends. One is the error that God is my enemy. When I'm suffering, when I'm di in difficulties, God is against me. God is my enemy. And that's absolutely wrong for every believer. It's certainly wrong about Job. We're told that in the beginning that Job was blameless. God was proud of Job. Uh, he was definitely not God's, uh, God was definitely not Job's enemy in bringing this upon him. Now he brought upon him a lot of difficulty. But he did bring it on him as an enemy. So if you don't bring it on as an enemy, how do you bring it? His friend, right? So God is bringing it as a friend. as somebody that's trying to help Job and benefit Job. The second thing is, well, God is wrong to allow me to suffer. If God is going to hold up his end of the bargain, his end of the deal, then I'm not going to suffer. So when I'm suffering and I haven't done anything wrong, God's not holding up his end of the bargain. He's not being faithful. And that's an error. And as Elihu sits and listens to these, it just makes his blood boil. And then number three he finally confronts the issue that Job says there's no point in serving God. If you serve God and you suffer, and you don't serve God and you suffer, why bother serving God? And then finally, the fourth thing, and we'll talk about this at the end today, God plans to harm me. That's a lie. God has no plans to harm you. God plans to to do you good and to turn everything in your life for good. We need to remember that and keep that up front. Look at chapter 33, verse 10. The, the issue here about God being our enemy. Job said, God is picking a quarrel with me and he considers me his enemy. Now Elihu is quoting Job. And he says, I'm going to deal with that. That can't be true. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you'll open our eyes of your word today. Father, as we see these answers, as we go through these passages, we'll understand who you are and just how much you are on our side. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Job is saying, God is my enemy. He's turned against me. He's harming me. But Elihu says that's not true. God uses suffering to help us achieve something greater in our life that cannot be accomplished if we have a life of ease and comfort. There are things that God wants to do in our life, things that are wrong in our life that we're not even aware of until pain comes along. And pain makes us see the Lord. I pray more when things aren't going well. Sorry to confess that, but you do too, don't you? When you have a difficulty, the things are hurt, you say, God, why? What's going on? When we have a difficulty, it drives us to our knees. It causes us to plead to God. It causes us to seek out, what is God doing? Why is things not going the way I want them to go? Anybody in this room ever had disappointment in your life? Okay, if you haven't, hang in there. It's coming. <laughs> And part of the difficult thing that we have to learn in order to live life successfully is how to get over disappointment. How to deal with it and go on. Because you let disappointment knock you down and say, well, I didn't get this, so I guess I'm through. No, you're not through. God is just dealing with things in your life. He's got something better for you down the road. God is using suffering to help us accomplish the things that we need to accomplish. Look at uh, verse 14. He says, For God speaks again and again, though people do not recognize it. God is never silent. Sometimes it seems like God is. We're praying and God isn't answering our prayer. We say, God, you're not, you're not saying anything. God, you're being quiet. Uh, God, you're just not answering my prayer. God, I, I don't seem to be getting anything from you. Well, God is still speaking. He's speaking through pain. He's speaking through the difficulties sometimes that we have in life. 
God may even speak to you in a dream. He certainly is going to speak to you in the Word. Remember, Job didn't have any of this. If Job, God's going to speak to Job, he had to speak to him through those means. God can speak to you through his Word. Many times the problem is we're not listening to what God is saying because it's not what we want to hear. We're looking for the solution, and God is trying to direct us through the process. And he's going to bring the solution in his good time and in his good way. Verse 17 says, He makes them turn from doing wrong. He keeps them from pride. We talked about this last week. God is in the business of keeping us from our greatest enemy, which is pride. It was pride that caused Satan to seek to go to the top of the hill, to sit on the throne as though he were God. By the way, I've got a position sheet available if you'd like a job. Uh, this is a preliminary application for the job of God. We're going to discuss this next week. Uh, if you'd like to do that, uh, I'll go over the questions next week. But if you're interested, I've got it. It's employment application, desired position, God. We have several copies in the back. I uh, handed out in Sunday school this morning. Richard handed out in Sunday school. If you're interested, you can take the job and uh, uh, application. You can fill out the question. See, do you qualify to be the one running the world? much less your own life. It's much better to allow God to lead our life. God disciplines us with pain and with sickness, verse 19 tells us. God is getting our attention because he wants us to focus on him. He wants us to recognize what was wrong with us. Even if we are blameless, if we're a person of integrity, there are still things God wants to work on in our life. Blameless, being a person of integrity doesn't mean you never sin. Or you don't have a serious problem within. You don't get rid of your sin nature because you trust Christ. That stays with you until the Lord returns. First John 3, 1 says, when he appears, we shall be like him. But we shall be see him as he is. There's going to be a transformation in us at that point. But up until then, we're going to have to deal with a sin problem. And God is dealing with the root problem of sin. Now, we were talking in the Wednesday night class that you're not a sinner because you sin, you sin because you're a sinner. We have a sin nature. It comes out in sin. Every child is born in this world with a sin nature. And it comes out as they get older. You see that in children because they sin. They don't, they're not sinners because they sin. They sin because they're sinners. They have a sin nature that they have inherited from their father. It's just the truth. I'm not trying to be funny. That's just the truth. It's inherited. It's a sin nature. It's a pride issue. Deep down, that has to be dealt with. Job has that pride issue. Job thinks he can run the world better than God. He thinks he can run his own life better than God. And God says, there's no way. And I've got to deal with that. Or you will not be a person of integrity. You cannot be the ultimate person that I want you to be as long as the problem of pride is still in your life. God is not your enemy. He is your friend trying to deal with a deep problem inside of you. I've had some surgeons that hurt me terribly. Uh, I had a surgeon cut my side open about five and a half inches and stick his hand in some, stick his hand up inside of me and feel around all over my belly. I had another one. I watched him cut. cut there's a slash across my hand. Cut a mark, a slash across my hand. Uh, you know, I had another one. I've got several marks where they, they had to sew me up. Uh, I'm basically held together with thread, apparently. Uh, you know why they did those things? Because they hated me. Right? No, that's not why they did it. Why did they do it? Because I had a problem that was making me miserable. One was going to kill me. And said, you know, we've got to deal with this problem. And then he was going to have to hurt me. And it took months of recovery because of that. But he, he hurt me because he was trying to help me. In fact, it was the only way he could help me. God is hurting us 
Because it's the only way he can help you. It's the only way he can accomplish in your life what he needs to accomplish. It's through pain. It's through suffering. God is indeed the great physician. He knows what it's going to take to accomplish what he wants to accomplish in and through your life. God never gives Job the opportunity to understand the full picture. Job, we'll see next week when he gets to the end, he never gets the answer he's looking for. God, what were you trying to accomplish with all of this? But think of the countless people that have been helped by the book of Job through the years. I think if you were to say, Job, I'm going to hurt you terribly. I'm going to push you down in the mud. You're going to have terrible, terrible times. But you're going to come through that. And on the other side of that, we're going to write a, a, a drama about your life, a monologue, a dramatic monologues that can be delivered, and we're going to help people who are going to suffer from now to the time that the Lord comes back. And they're going to see how good you were, and they're going to see what God did, and they're going to be able to persevere through what they need to persevere because they have read and studied through the book of Job. Job, would you be willing to sign up for that? I think Job would have signed up and said, okay, Lord, I'm good with that. You see, there are things that God wants to accomplish, not just in your life, but through your story in the lives of other people. And he can't do that unless he hurts you. Unless he puts you through suffering and difficulty. God is showing your life to others so they also are encouraged and able to go on in the difficulties that they're going to be facing. We're in a veil of tears. We're in a time of sorrow and grief. But it's only a short time. And the Lord is coming back. And we're going to be victorious. Even things that aren't resolved now are going to be resolved then. God is going to pull all of that together. All of the difficulty. All of the suffering. All the things we have questions for and which we don't know the answer. But on the other side, the answers are not going to be important. Neither are the questions because it's going to work out. And we're going to recognize that it had to work out this way because God would not have allowed it to happen any other way. Because he's loved us. And he's accomplishing that which is good in our life. God is not our enemy. God is indeed our friend. He's not wrong to allow us to suffer. That's in chapter 34, verse 6. Job said, I am innocent, but they call me a liar. My suffering is incurable, though I have not sinned. What is wrong? He is innocent. He is being called a liar, liar but his suffering is not incurable. You see, your suffering can be cured. Not Mother's Day, but how many of you mothers suffered when you gave birth? How many of you had more than one child? Must be curable. You go through it twice, three times, more. You recognize the pain is worth it to accomplish certain things in our life. God is not wrong to allow us to suffer. He's not wrong to even let the wicked go free for a time. God is doing what he needs to do in the moment you and I are suffering difficulties, not uniquely necessarily, although some of you are, but almost everybody's had prices rise on the things you buy. So the gas has gone down from last year. That's great. Still a lot higher than it needs to be, but it's gone, a lot, it's gone down. That's good. I could, I could use that. Maybe that's why people are gone. They've gone they would go on trips because uh, the gas is down. Uh, we sometimes think people should never get sick unless they've engaged in sinful behavior. They shouldn't even die when they get old. How many of you think that would be a good thing? To just get older and older and never die. No, we recognize that's not really a good thing. There's a point where you say, you know, I think I want out of this. But God, even in his mercy, didn't leave us. Remember in the garden? He didn't leave us in the garden to eat from the tree of life. So we've lived forever in this sinful condition. He made death possible. Because if he didn't make death possible, then not even Christ could have died. 
and there's been absolutely no solution to the problem we're in. Even the death that we die, the fact that we can die, enables salvation because Christ died in our place and rose again. He showed us there's a way through death and on to the other side. No, God is not wrong to allow us to suffer. He's showing us the goodness of God. Look at verses 14 and 15. If God were to take back his spirit and withdraw his breath, all life would cease and humanity would turn again to dust. The fact that we're breathing, we talked about this last week, the fact that we're breathing lets us know that God is gracious. He has shared life with us. That's where it comes from. It comes from God, the ability to breathe in his air. And when we expel it, we recognize we're sharing with God. He's allowing us to live. God is good. Job and his three friends correctly believe that God brings punishment. Job has countered that he is innocent and therefore it must be God who is wrong. And Elihu is as convinced as the three friends, by the way, that Job did something wrong. He doesn't harp on it. He doesn't try to convince Job that he's a sinner. He's dealing with what Job has said because he is sinning. Job is not suffering because he sinned, but he is sinning in response to his suffering. It may be that your suffering is not because of sin, but you may be sinning because you're suffering. Because you don't feel good. You don't feel well. Because you don't think you deserve what you're going through. And it may turn you away from God, but that's not the point. God doesn't want us to do that. God wants us to rejoice in Him. Verse 19 of chapter 34 says, He doesn't care how great a person may be. He pays no more attention to the rich than to the poor. He made them all. God is not scared to discipline the rich or the poor. In a moment, they die. In the middle of the night, they pass away, and the mighty are removed without a human hand. God has set the time and the place, not us. It is God who's working all things out for good, for, for his good. Uh, in uh, chapter 6, verse 24, teach me, and I'll be quiet. <clears throat> Show me what I've done wrong. You know, when I read that earlier, I was going through, I thought, well, that sounds about right. Sounds like Job's got a good attitude. But the way I read it right now didn't sound that way, did it? You see, Elihu is pointing out to Job you have a rebellious spirit against God. Must God tailor his justice to your demands? But you have rejected him. The choice is yours, not mine. Go ahead, share your wisdom with us, Eli, you challenges Job. You're the one. You're speaking in rebellion in what you have said and what you're doing. You're not saying, God, I just want to learn what I'm doing wrong so I can correct it. He's saying, God, you're not treating me right. You need to tell me what I've done wrong. I haven't done wrong. You see, sometimes our pride comes out as humility. But it's really pride. It's really saying, you know, I don't think God is running things right. I don't think God knows the way to run my life. And I want him to tell me what's going on. See, it shows a pride that says, God works for me instead of me being the servant of God. Different attitude, is it? How many times do we think, well, God, you ought to make my life like I want my life to be? Instead of saying, God, I'm here to do your will. Remember that's what Jesus said? What I come, in the volume of the book it is written in me to do your will, O oh Lord. That's the correct attitude and a a action we ought to have in regard to that. Dr. Zuck, Dr. Roy Zuck, Bible Knowledge Commentary said this, Elihu felt, and rightly so, that such <clears throat> talk was uncalled for. But Job, he was seeking to tell God what to do. But since God is sovereign, he will not stoop to man's turn especially in the face of a non-repentant attitude. I have a note here. 
dramatic lightning was flashing in the distance as Elihu was saying this. In a few seconds, there was a boom of thunder over the ash heap, and the wind begins to pick up. And Elihu, in chapter 35, verse 3, verses 2 and 3, begins talking to Job about where he says there's no point to serving the Lord. Elihu said, do you think it's right for you to claim I'm righteous before God? But you also ask, what's in it for me? What's the use of living a righteous life? Told the men Thursday night, <clears throat> everybody in the world listens to WIFM every day. WIIFM. Radio say, I learned this in a presentation. Everybody in the world tunes into WIIFM. It's the most powerful radio station in the world. What's in it for me? WIIFM. Everybody, every day, is thinking, what's in it for me? If I do this, what's in it for me? If I go to school, what's in it for me? Now, students, you're required by law to be there. Teachers and principals, you're required by paycheck to be there. At least that's in it for me. What's in it for me if I go to work? Very few of us will go to work for no money. We were asking for what's in it for me. If I come do this, are you going to give me? We, we operate that way. And yet you cannot operate that way before God. You can't say, I'm righteous. I am one of God's righteous creatures. What's in it for me, God? God, why don't you do things the way I want you to do? I want things to go my way. And that's Job. That's what he's saying. Everyone is going to die. So why not do what pleases you? Whether it hurts someone else or not. You see, that's really the attitude. What's in it for me? If you're not going to give me the blessings because I do right, why should I even do right? And Elihu points out the fact that if you're good, is this some great gift to God? What could you possibly give him? Verse 8. No, your sins affect only people like yourself. And your good deeds also affect only human beings. You see, God is neither less nor greater by whether we sin or do what's right. It's not going to affect heaven. It's not going to affect the character of God. It's not going to change God's truth whether I live righteously or don't live righteously. Where it comes down and how it has an effect is the effect it has on other people, on fellow human beings, whether I do that which is right or not. If I cheat somebody, if I hurt somebody, we are turning away from God's way into sin and bringing the consequence of that to those who would love us or do love us. If you decide to treat other people right, it's them we help, not God. Michael Johnson, who's with the Slavic Gospel Association, quoted, wrote a quote, and I'll put it up here. I want you to follow along as I read this. Most marriages in this world are not Christ-centered, but sin-centered. Husbands and wives allow their sin to fuel the combat with each other, seeking to satisfy or defend their own desires and expectations. Love of self outweighs love of others. And much like the war in Ukraine, there is collateral damage. The children. Broken marriages lead to broken lives and broken homes with orphans or displaced children being the evidence of this. Yet much like the war in Ukraine, God has raised up his church to bring hope to broken marriages, to see families restored to God's design. These battles, of course, are among us wherever we are, and so is the solution. Christ can make all things new. Setting a relationship on Christ and his word mends broken hearts and renews relationships. <laughs> Elihu goes on to say in verse 9, chapter 35, People cry out when they're oppressed. They groan beneath the power of the mighty. And yet they don't ask, Where is God, my creator? The one who gives songs 
in the night. Now, what in the world does he mean by that? I think he's referring to Psalm 77, verses 5 and 6, or maybe not referring to that, but it's, it's said there. Here's the same attitude, same word used. Listen. I think of the good old days, long since ended, when my nights were filled with joyful songs. I search my soul and I ponder the difference now. You see, he's looking back on a time when he was able to sing songs in the night. Where did those songs come from? They came from the same God that's allowing him to suffer right now for a good purpose. You see, it is God who makes our hearts merry, who gives us songs in the night. Maybe you don't break forth in song at night, but sometimes at night you're laying there and you think happy thoughts. Maybe you even think of a happy song and it lifts your spirit. And sometimes when you're praising God, the most natural thing in the world to do to praise God is to sing or to think of a hymn that lifts up God and sings to God. Think of a song that lifts up God and brings praise to God. Elihu is revealing the hidden problem that Job has. His problem of pride. Verse 12 he says, And when they cry out, does not God answer? God, I'm sorry, let me read that right. And when they cry out, God does not answer because of their cry. But it's wrong to say God doesn't listen, to say the Almighty isn't concerned. You say you can't see, but he will bring justice if you only wait. What obligation is God under to answer the demands of the proud? None whatsoever. God will do what he needs to do what he has planned to do, what it is good to do, because God is good. Psalm 711 says this, God is an honest judge. He is angry with the wicked every day. That's a sobering thought. Not a day that goes by that God is not angry with the wicked. Maybe you see people doing wickedness. And it makes you angry. It makes me angry when I see that. When you hear about it, it just makes me angry. Why well, don't I like to watch the dramas before I go to bed? I go to bed mad. Somebody got an injustice. It makes me mad. You can't sleep good. You got to lay all that aside and try to get to sleep. And just say, okay, God's angry. God's angry about it. I'm going to let God deal with it. God is angry with the wicked every day because he's an honest judge. Now, at this point, the wind is starting to blow pretty seriously. It's gone from a cooling breeze to it's the storm is coming. Thunder rumbles and it's more frequent. And then in chapter 36, Elihu begins to wrap up his argument about God, that this lie that God plans to harm me. Chapter 36, verse 2. Let me go on and I'll show you the truth, for I've not yet finished defending God. I will present profound arguments for the righteousness of my Creator. I am telling you nothing but the truth, for I am a man of great knowledge. It's not pride, he's just telling the truth. I know a great God. And I want to tell you about Him. And I'm here to defend God. By the way, we need people to do that. We're in an age where people ought to be training to be apologists, to be those who defend the truth of Scripture, who show why God is right and the world in which we're living in is wrong. He doesn't take a back seat and back up and say, well, I don't want to answer your objection. Let me answer your objection. Let me show you that the way you're thinking about God and about his world is wrong. Let me show you the right way. Let me show you why it's the right way. Let me give you a reason why I have hope. And we need people to do that. Elihu is one of those guys. And God is not criticizing Elihu. He never criticizes Elihu for what he says, even though he's got a couple of clinkers in here, uh, like thinking Job was a sinner. Uh, but he recognizes, Job, you may not, this may not have come from your sin, but you sin the whole lot in what you're doing. God has a good purpose for the afflicted. Verses 8 and 10. If they're bound in chains and caught in a web of trouble, he shows them the reason. He shows them their sins of pride. He gets their attention and commands that they turn from evil. 
God wants to turn us from that which is evil. Not because it's evil to him. Remember, we already established it doesn't hurt God. Because it's going to destroy you, and it's going to destroy the love relationship with the people you have around you. God wants you to do what's right. The humble will learn and obey, and then they will be greatly blessed. The godless resent the very idea of God teaching them anything. I encourage you to watch some of these debates on YouTube between those who don't believe in God and those who do. And you'll see that the godless, they don't have any desire to learn from God. They're arrogant in their ways. Rather than humbling themselves, they turn to wicked words and wicked ways. Rather than deal with our own faults, we start pointing the finger at those more wicked than ourselves. And eventually, we point that finger at God. Verse 16, he says, For God is leading you away from danger, Job, to a place free from distress. He is setting your table with the best food. You see, Job has gotten a sour look on life. He thinks, My suffering is incurable. And Elihu says, no, it's not. God is setting the best food for you. But you're obsessed with whether the godless will be judged. Whether God is going to get the people that stole your camel. Or God is going to get the people that took off your cattle. That killed your workers. You're obsessed with that. Don't worry. And then he says these words that ought to strike terror. Judgment and justice will be upheld. God is going to bring justice. Woe to anyone who is unjust or has done unjust things when the Lord returns. Job is worrying about things that are certainly going to take place. Maybe not in his lifetime, but it's going to take place. Well, they died. It doesn't matter to God. God is going to bring Listen, God is going to bring every person on the face of the earth before me. No exception. Doesn't matter how rich they are, how famous they are, how poor they are, how infamous they are, whatever it is, God has a day of judgment appointed. You don't have to worry, will God bring judgment? God's going to bring judgment. What we need to be seeking is salvation before that day of judgment comes. Because it's coming. It's not going to necessarily be from human hands. It's going to be from the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to judge those who have done on this earth. We don't need to worry about things that are certainly going to happen. Verses 18 and 19, chapter 36, he says, But well, watch out, or you may be seduced by wealth. Don't let yourself be bribed into sin. Put all your wealth for all your mighty efforts keep you from distress. You want to know how useless wealth is? Think about who Job was. Job was the wealthiest guy in his area. Job was famous for his wealth. It did nothing to keep him from suffering. That's a great thing to have money. When trouble comes because you can buy stuff. But it doesn't stop bad things from happening. Let's talk about uh, the guy about the, the advances in medical treatment. And, uh, in the night, early 1960s, John Kennedy was president of the United States. He was a millionaire. He had a tremendous family fortune. His wife had a son. And they did everything they possibly could to try to save that son. Nothing was held back, nothing restricted. The boy died. If that had been happening in the 19th 90s when we were talking about it we would have spent just as much money on the child that the child would have lived you see all the money he had back then did provide the solution it wasn't time for that solution to be there Job was unable to avoid the suffering that came upon him though he had all the wealth that a man could want at that time he wasn't able to prevent disaster from coming into his life. God controls things. Joe's wealth would not keep him from distress. 
we are susceptible to these things. <coughs> he has spoken sinful words against God, but he's not yet acted upon them. His faith in God is wavering. And the false doctrine he has embraced will bring more ruin if he does not repent. He thinks God is capricious. Means he does whatever he wants to on whim. And unjust. And Job is close to cursing God to his face if he could find the face of God. Rather than judging God, Job and we ought to come to the place where we worship God in the midst of our difficulties. Say, God, what you do is good and right. Right here says no one can tell him what to do or say to him, you've done wrong. Instead, glorify his mighty works, singing songs of praise. <clears throat> what should we do? We ought to be praising God. Can we do what God does? There's the application. You take the questions, fill it out, and see are you qualified? to run the world. He says we're not qualified to run the world. He says he makes these things happen either to punish people or to show his unfailing love. The things that happened to Job were going to happen to Pharaoh in Egypt. They happened to Job because God wanted to bless Job. They happened to Pharaoh in Egypt because God wanted to put Pharaoh down and to demonstrate there's one God and you're not here. For one, it is for unfailing love. For other, it is a punishment that destroyed his nation. It is God's plan and purpose, not our plan and purpose. Can we do as God does? No. But we can learn and worship and exalt the Lord even in the midst of our suffering. Here's the point. Whether we are experiencing terrible suffering or tremendous blessing, we should fear God and show Him the reverence due to His name. Whatever the circumstance, we ought to honor God. In humility, we should be grateful that the Almighty does not destroy us because we are unjust and unrighteous and unfit to stand in His presence. We should rejoice and praise His name that He is gracious to us even when we respond to suffering with sinful words. Aren't you glad God doesn't throw you out the first time you complain? Don't tell me you didn't complain. God understands. He can take it, but he's going to persist until you praise him. Let me suggest three truths, or four truths, as we close. That four areas and four truths. Number one, when we suffer, it is allowed by a loving friend who could stop it, but is working out a higher purpose for ourselves and for others. God could stop what's going on in your life today. But he loves you too much to do that until it's accomplished. Number two, God is not wrong to allow us to suffer, whether that be the loss of goods, the death of family, or even our own failing health. God is working all things for my eternal good and to bring others to repentance, myself included. Number three, there is a point to serving God. He's worthy of worship. Doesn't matter if he ever blessed us with anything material. God is worthy of worship. It's worth worshiping God because he's worth it. He deserves it. You've never met anybody like God. You've met some people that maybe point you in the direction of God, but you've never met anybody like God. You never had anybody that good, that loving, that gracious. Number four, God plans to bring us through harm 
As he blessed Job, his divine power will give us things that we cannot possibly imagine or even dream of now. When you go to the end of Job, you read chapter 42, you see that God gave Job back exactly twice what he had before. God had a plan to bless Job. Not because Job did what was right. Not because Job was willing to go through the suffering. Not because Job responded to the suffering well. But it was God's plan to bless Job. Nothing was going to change that. It was going to be accomplished. God has a plan to bless you. Nothing is going to change that plan. God has determined you're going to be blessed. This is not prosperity theology. You trust God, you do this, and God will bless you with all kinds of material things. Let's do what God has to bless you with. You, have, you can't even imagine what it is. I has not seen nor ear heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. You have no idea. You can't even imagine. You can't even think what it is. But when it comes, you're going to recognize he has fully repaid me for all that I've gone through. It was worth it all to go through whatever I've gone through. In fact, I don't even want the answers that I'm so desperate to get to my questions because it doesn't matter anymore. It is so wonderful to be in the presence of God and to worship 